Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Jay Miller, and I get to serve on staff here as minister to kids. Um, And it's my honor to be with you this morning as we look at what Jesus says, this statement of, I am the bread of life. And this morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, looking at a very familiar story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And I want to start by asking this question. Do you ever feel like what you have to offer is not enough? Do you ever feel like what you have to offer is not enough? Or that you don't have what it takes? A trivial example of that is uh, this past spring, I joined up with one of our connect groups here and was on their men's basketball team with our church's uh, spring men's basketball league. And that was a great moment for me to be reminded that I don't have enough. (laughs) Um, It was a very humbling experience at moments. Uh, It's been about probably 15 years or so since I played intramural uh, basketball in college. And so there were several moments, I know for some of you, you're surprised to think that I would struggle with basketball with this great stature and all. Um, I do throw down lots of dunks on eight foot goals, but when they're back, back up at 10, it's a little bit more of a struggle for me. And I found myself at different times during the season saying, do I have what it takes? Do do I have enough to bring something of substance and of value to our team? We found ourselves one week where we had five players show up for our game. That's not good. That's bad. Um, We had no subs. And we were playing a team from DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary, and they had like 24, 25 year olds, like, you know, like a bench of like five deep, like they were rotating out like teams of players, it felt like at times. And I'm sitting there going, is that clock ever going to hit zero? I don't have enough. I, we for, forget winning the game. We just, can, we, can we finish the game? That's, all, that's our goal tonight. It was, it was a struggle. There was another moment in the season where I was playing defense, I was out there, and we had to switch guys uh, for different reasons, and I found myself face-to-face with a guy who played Division I college football for the University of Georgia. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, in that moment, I'm sitting there saying, I'm about to become the next viral sensation. There's going to be a meme of me here in just a moment, but praise God, he passed the ball, right? And so the like, kind of my knees were like, they, they were, they're still shaking now from that experience, right? There were plenty of times that season where I realized I don't have enough. <laughs> I don't have what it takes to be playing like this. I am not this age anymore. What have I done? Maybe for some of you, you are wrestling with that question today of do you ever feel like what you have to offer is not enough. Maybe it's the demands of your job. Maybe it's changed as we've come out of COVID. Or maybe you're in a new job. Maybe, maybe you were part of the great resignation and you have a new job and it seemed like the grass was going to be greener on the other side. And now you find yourself wondering, do I have what it takes to do this job? Maybe for some of you, it's, it's parenting your kids. And yes, the kids that God has blessed us with, they are a blessing from the Lord. But there are also times where we wonder, do I have what it takes to be their parent? Do I have what it takes to be the best dad or the best husband for my family? Or maybe you have an aging parent. And so you are dealing with that, with that tension of trying to be the best for your mom or dad as they are in their final years and making sure that you really do honor your father and mother while also wrestling with the fact that you still have kids and even grandkids. And there's that tension there of, do I have enough for everybody in my family? This morning, we're gonna kind of look at that question. Do you ever feel like, what you have to offer is not enough or that you don't have what it takes. And if I'm being completely transparent with you this morning, I've wrestled through that feeling over the last few weeks, even just preparing this sermon. I mean, it's Jesus feeds the 5,000. How do I make this not feel like the world's longest children's sermon, right? As a minister to kids, do I have enough? Do I have what it takes? And this morning, we're gonna look at the fact And we're going to wrestle with this statement, I don't have enough. 
It's one of Jesus' most well-known miracles. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's actually the only miracle that all four Gospels talk about pre-crucifixion. And so we're in Matthew 14, verse 13. And it says this. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. To kind of set up this story a little bit more, it uses this phrase at the very beginning. It says, now when Jesus heard this. And what what has happened up until this point, at the end of Matthew 13, we see Jesus go into the synagogue in his hometown and preach in the synagogue. And it says that they rejected him. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. This is the place where he grew up. 30 years of his life with these people that he's around. And he brings a word and he is rejected. Some of his longest relationships, the ties are severed or damaged in that moment. Lifelong friends that have said, we're through. We're done. And he has to deal with rejection from those who have known him the longest and known him for 30 years of his life, potentially. And then, John the Baptist's disciples come and find him and say, hey, John the Baptist has been killed the one family member that hadn't rejected him, right? right? The one that was potentially the closest to him, the forerunner for him being uh, in ministry, preaching that he is coming, his cousin, someone that he has grown up with, has just died. And so now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. We find Jesus in this moment walking through grief. And Jesus is dealing with potentially some of the deepest grief he might have dealt with yet in his 30 years of earthly life. And he needs to get away. As he's dealing with that grief, he's got to get away. Right? I think about last week's sermon where we talked about how Jesus needed rest, right? how we are called to rest. And Jesus shows us, hey, here's what this looks like to rest, to get away. And so Jesus, walking through that grief, has to get away. And many of us are walking through grief right now as well. As we said a second ago, maybe for some of you, it's Memorial Day weekend itself, Maybe there's grief here in this weekend of a loved one that you have lost who gave their life for this country so that we could have the freedoms we have. I think about friends of ours from Houston, Matt and Sarah, and her brother who gave his life and how this weekend is a totally different weekend for her than it is for me. And thanks be to God that he was a follower of Jesus and they get to celebrate that. But this weekend is a weekend for grief for her. Maybe for some of you, it's the SBC report that came out last Sunday or Monday. And just reading the stories, it's maybe triggered grief in your, in your, from your past, past abuse, past hurt. Or maybe it's just reading the stories and you grieve for them. And you grieve for those women that should have been protected but weren't. And if you want to see what our statement is on this, we've actually put that on our website to let you know 
that women are valuable and they are important and they should be protected. Everyone should be protected. Everyone should have a seat at the table. Or maybe it's watching what's happened down in Uvalde and just thinking through the grief for those families this weekend and what should be a, a weekend to kind of kick off summer fun and excitement and all that's to come over the next couple of months is a totally different weekend for them filled with grief and questions and hurt and anger and confusion. Many of us are walking through grief right now. And what I would remind you is that Jesus did too. He empathizes with you. He just doesn't sympathize with you. He empathizes with you in where you're at in your grief. The apostle Paul even talks about grief with the people in Corinth when he says in 2 Corinthians 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. You see, the people knew where Jesus was going and they wanted to follow him. Jesus needed that moment to grieve, but also notice what happens. It says that when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. As Jesus was walking through that grief, he also had people coming after him, following him. And the reason that they were following him is what I would say is kind of our first point for the morning. And that's this, recognize you don't have enough. I have to recognize that I don't have enough. The people here in this story, they recognize that they didn't have enough. They traveled for miles. They traveled from area towns because they knew that Jesus was gonna be there and that he might heal them. He might bring them that restoration that they needed, that healing that they needed. They knew they didn't have enough. And they needed Jesus to do something. They needed Jesus to heal them. The gospel in, in Mark, when Mark is describing this, he says that Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And what I would show you is that as these people are approaching and Jesus is dealing with this grief, that grief allows him to have compassion. Grief leads to compassion. And compassion leads to action. How many of us this week have found ourselves being more compassionate, having more moments where we are showing compassion to people because of what we watched happen in South Texas? We find ourselves being more thankful for people like school crossing guards and teachers. Grief leads to compassion. But also compassion should lead to action. And what does it say? It says that he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus shows us the ultimate act of compassion through what he did on the cross. He meets our need for a savior by giving up his life on the cross. He models this all throughout his life. Ultimately, it's how he gives up his life is through an act of compassion because we have a need. And so many times it's easy to get into the, the idea that I don't really have a need. If I do, I can run to the grocery store, grab it real quick, or I can order it online. It's here by the next day, or in some cases, day of. Amazing. It's easy to get into the habit of thinking, I don't have really that many needs. And Jesus says, you do have needs. You have a need for a savior. And he shows us that ultimate compassion by what he did, what he did on the cross. And we get to verse 15 and 16. And I love that this is a great teaching moment that Jesus has with his disciples. It says, now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages to buy food for themselves. But Jesus says, they need not go away. 
You give them something to eat. And I kind of want to just think about what it might would have been like for the disciples right there in that moment. You know, they're kind of off to the side, like, you tell him. <laughs> I ain't tell him. We're getting a little late. Um, ah, dang. Hey, Jesus, you know, and you, you kind of want, are they, are they hesitant? I kind of read it and think, I think they had compassion. I think they were coming to Jesus out of an act of compassion. They've been watching him all day, healing people and teaching. They've watched him as he's gone through grief, how it's led to compassion. I think they were showing that same compassion here. And I think they have the right intentions and they're acting out of compassion. The problem is the disciples are looking at the situation instead of looking at Jesus. Therefore, they have the wrong approach. I think they really are thinking, we need to get these people out of here. They got to go eat. They gotta get, we got to get them food. This is, it was a compassionate move on their part. They were, they were acting out of compassion, but they weren't looking at Jesus. Therefore, they didn't have the right approach. And Jesus uses this moment to teach his disciples. I, th I think if I'm correct, it's the only miracle you see where Jesus allows his disciples to be a part of the miracle. They actually are the ones that take the bread to the men, women, and children. They get to be a part of this miracle. He lets them be involved. And it got to become for them a teaching moment for his disciples. Do we come in with a teachable spirit? When was the last time that you allowed yourself to have a teaching moment from Jesus? So the first thing, recognize you don't have enough. The second thing, what you bring to Jesus is enough. Because if you stop with just the first one, this is not accurate <laughs> biblically from a sermon perspective. You have to have this second point as well. It's important to recognize we don't have enough, but what you bring to Jesus is enough. Verse 17, it says this. It says, they said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And I love John's account because John, when he talks about this story in the gospel of John, he's the only gospel writer that points out the boy, that points out the child, that they have the five loaves and two fish because they found it from a kid. You know, chances are it's like a fifth or sixth grader and it's like his snack to tide him over till dinner because they eat so much, right? So it's not a lot that, that the kid's bringing. But John says that it's a child that produces the bread and fish. And I can't help but wonder, this kid has been there all day. He's been watching Jesus teach. He's been watching Jesus do miracles, and so when it comes time for food and, they, and he brings this five bread, two fish before Jesus, I kind of wonder, is, is he expecting Jesus to do something? Is he coming in faithful knowing that Jesus is gonna do something with this? Why? Because he's been watching him heal people all day. So many times it's the faith of a child that you see, that you see action. Right? Kids know they don't have enough but they bring what they do have to Jesus. This is one of the favorite parts of my job is that I get to spend time with kids and their mom and dad and talk about gospel conversations. When kids make that decision to follow Jesus, I get to sit down and talk about that with them. That's one of the best parts of my job. This past Wednesday night, as we were wrapping up the, the prayer service for, uh, for Uvalde, me and Pastor Jeff were... Uh, we're there at the end talking with a fourth grader and her mom and dad because she had made the decision to follow Jesus and she was ready to finally be baptized and to tell her fa church family the decision that she had made to follow Jesus. And so we're gonna meet up later on at, some, at her favorite dessert place, me, her, and mom and dad. Why? Because it's a celebration. So if we're gonna celebrate the fact that she's been saved by Jesus, you got to have dessert as a part of the equation. It just has to happen, right? You have to, you have to do an Andy's frozen custard run or, you know, whatever else it is. It's a celebration because of what Jesus has done in her and through her and the faith that she has to trust him. The faith that this boy has as he brings his bread and fish 
before Jesus and trusts him with it. But somewhere along the way, we tend to lose that perspective. I need to work harder to get more is the idea that we come to. I've got to work harder to to get more. And that's not what the gospel says. That's not what scripture teaches us. I think we need to remember two things. What we have is from him anyways. Everything you have is from Jesus. Everything you have is because God has placed it in your life. Second thing, you don't have enough to do it on your own. Because if you did, you wouldn't need Jesus. If you had enough to do it on your own, you wouldn't need, you wouldn't have that need for a savior, that need for Jesus to come in. And it's this, there's a saying I hear, and I, I think, again, it's right intentions, but you hear people say that God will never give you more than you can handle. And I hear that and I think, no, he will because it draws you back to him. It pushes you back to him. He'll never give you more than he can handle because he is in control. And sometimes we need to be pushed back into realizing that what I bring to Jesus is enough. Without Jesus in the equation, it's not enough. But with Jesus in the equation, it's enough. On Tuesday, we were talking through this as a teaching team. And all of us who are preaching around campus today were talking about this. And one of the things that we were talking about is that throughout this whole series, we've been talking about how Jesus is king. And that he's inviting us into his kingdom. But there's, there's also a new math in his kingdom. And Marlon Rios, who is a DBU professor, he's actually, uh, he attends the 1230 service. He's preaching this, this afternoon in our 1230 Espanol service. He said this, and I loved it. He said, without Jesus in the mathematical equation, five plus two equals seven. Without Jesus in the mathematical equation, five plus two equals seven. But when Jesus is in the equation, five plus two equals 5,000 plus. There's a new math in the kingdom of Jesus. You see, when Jesus is there, it's more than enough. So what do we do? Verse 18, you bring it to Jesus. You bring it to Jesus. He said to them, bring them here to me. God simplifies it for us. What you have, you bring to Jesus. And that is enough. Are you bringing what you have to Jesus or are you trying to do it all on your own? There's a husband and wife that started teaching in our kids ministry this year and they were... uh, we uh, got together for lunch a few weeks ago to talk about how it's gone, how much they hate me now that I've asked them to do this for a full year. Just kidding. Um, and talking about, you know, what does next year look like for them? Um, and he was talking, the husband was talking and he said, you know, my wife is the one that really has the gift of teaching. This, this is kind of, I mean, I kind of came in more as a warm body in the room, um, just kind of almost like crowd control, you know, bodyguard type thing. He said, But as we got into it, I realized that being there every other week, like we originally had thought, was not going to be enough. I needed to be in there every week because I wanted to get to know the boys. And I was getting to know them by having conversations at the table for those first 10 minutes or so as kids were arriving. And he realized that he might not be the one that's actually teaching the lesson, if you will. But what he was doing, developing the relationships with those guys, week in and week out, was vital because one of the things we strive for is that every kid is seen and every kid is loved. And he got that. And he said, we're in for next year. We're in for every week. And he's like, I can't wait. What he was bringing to Jesus is all that he had and it was enough. Why? Because five plus two doesn't equal seven when Jesus is in the equation. Five plus two equals 5,000 plus. And what you do ministry wise goes way beyond that when Jesus is in the equation. So recognize you don't have enough. What you bring to Jesus is enough. Why? Because Jesus is enough. 
I love what, what happens in verse 19. I'm gonna read this first before we go to verse 20. It says, then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and he took the loaves and the fish. He looked up to heaven. He said a blessing. Then he broke the bread. Right? He, he thanks God before anything even happens. He thanks God for what's about to happen before it even happens. And when Jesus breaks the bread, it goes further. Some of our greatest moments of ministry can come out of our brokenness and our grief. For me and my wife, Nicole, some of y'all know our story, but if you don't, um, we struggle with secondary infertility. So in 2011, we had our son, Corbin. He was born and haven't slept since. Um, but we had him, and then two years later, we, had, we got pregnant again, and it resulted in a miscarriage. And since then, we have not been able to get pregnant. And so there was a lot of grief that we walked through early on in those years. There's still times where it's, it comes upon us and it can catch us when we're not expecting it. But that grief led us to foster care. Foster care wasn't on our radar. We had talked about adopting someday. You know, that, that'd be great to do. Kind of once, we've, once we've got our, our family figured out, you know, kind of let's, let's maybe you know, add that in. It was kind of our approach early on. But then we went through this grief and we went through this brokenness and it led us to foster care. And in foster care, we've found this ministry where not only is it the kids that are coming into our home that we get to love, provide a safe place, but there's also, it's a wake up call for those parents. And there are a lot of parents who were working really hard, doing all the services, all the classes, all the trainings, because they had that wake up call and they wanted their kids back. They realized they made a mistake and they were trying to do all that they could to make sure that their kids came back into their home. And we realized there was a ministry there with those moms and dads. And in almost every situation, Nicole and that mom found this bond because she was able to say, you got this, you can do it. Let me be a word of encouragement for you. Let me encourage you that you are the best person to parent your kids. And if they can't, we will. But she was saying to them, you can do this. You can be there for your kids. And there was a great ministry to the parents who we had their kids in our home that we never would have expected. It's an incredible ministry that we got to be a part of. And sometimes God allows us to be broken so that we can experience greater things through him. Why? Because Jesus is enough. Verse 20, it says that they were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. In Jesus, we find satisfaction. When God takes what we offer, it's more than enough because of him. He wants all of what we bring before him. And then end of verse 20, it says, they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. I really debated this morning, had I had enough time, I was gonna wear a shirt that says, Jesus eats leftovers. Um, I'm a bad leftover eater. I'll just be honest. It's, it's something that has probably driven my wife nuts for the last 13 years of marriage. <laughs> and we've only been married 13, so all 13, if we're being honest. I am not a good leftover eater. And I try, I really do, but just, I'm lazy. And so this passage as I was reading it, I thought, Jesus eats leftovers. He doesn't let anything go to waste. And for you in your life, I would say Jesus doesn't let anything go to waste. God says, I want you to allow me to work through all of who you are. There is not a situation or an experience you've had that God does not want to use. And yes, there are questions as to why we go through those. Why he allowed it to happen to us and not to others or vice versa. But God wants to use all of what you go through. He wants you to bring all of who you are to him. Why? Because he's more than enough. He is more than enough. Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, 
I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because Jesus is enough. When you look at Matthew chapter 14, there's actually a, there's actually a story of two different feasts, two different banquets that happen in that chapter. See, the first part of Matthew chapter 14 is the, is the feast that Herod is having, his banquet, where John the Baptist is killed. You see, Herod's feast leads to death. But then we see Jesus' feast and Jesus' banquet leads to life. John 6, 35 is John's account of, of the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And just a few verses later, he says this. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Why? Because Jesus' feast, his banquet leads to life. Jesus says that he is the bread of life. Why? Because he got up on that cross for you and for me and said, I will take what they can't do and I will put it on my shoulders so that their relationship with God can be restored. Jesus says, you don't have enough, but he is enough. And what he did on the cross met your ultimate need of forgiveness of your sins and a savior who was perfect to step in in your place. And Jesus says that in him, you can be satisfied. In Jesus, you can find satisfaction. Jesus desires to be our daily bread. So back to the original question, what do you do when what you feel like what you have is not enough? You recognize you don't have enough. You bring what you do have to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is enough. And he will take what you bring to him and he will turn it into something beautiful and something that blesses others around you. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much for this morning. God, I thank you for the reminder that that you just want us to bring what we have to you. You want us to bring what we have, what you've gifted us with before you to say, here's my five plus two. And God, I need you to make it 5,000 plus. God, may we look at our own lives and ask the question, where is it that we are holding back from you? Where is it that we are not letting you be a part of the equation, Father? I mean, God, when you show us that, may we then respond in faith, knowing that you are enough. God, we love you. In your name we pray these things. Amen.